B'Shem Hashem Na'asev and Asliach. Welcome everyone to our weekly shiur on the parasha with the perush of the Zera Shimshon. Uh, today's parasha is Parashat Vayeshev. We're going to be doing Bezrat Hashem Derush Yud Aleph, the 11th Ma'amor of the Zera Shimshon on the parasha. This shiur is dedicated for the Rufuah Shalem of Kol Chole Am Yisrael, especially Yosef Ben Monabar, um, Yonatan Rafael Ben Gladi Simcha, uh, Avital uh, Hayabat Gladi Simcha, Michael Levi Ben Dina, Hava Chayabat Neda, Atarabat Lili, and Chayabat Sharona, and Yehuda Ben Afarim, and Oshri Ben Miriam, and Paribat Mohtaram. But Toch Sha'ar Kol Chole Am Yisrael. May the Zechut of the Zerah Shimshon be your Melitz Yosher and be given Rufuat and Nefesh Vadaguf to Kol Chole Am Yisrael. Um, it's dedicated for the Zechut uh, and Le'elui Nishmat, the Zerah Shimshon, Rav Shimshon Chaim ben Nachman Michael Nachmani. Um, may his Zechut and his guarantee that he says in his introduction beautifully. I'll read it, some of it in, in English for you. I, imp- I implore you with ten expressions of supplication to choose to study those portions of these novel concepts, the Zerah Shimshon, and find in favor in their eyes. Then he says, I'm going to read the rest towards the end. The measure of reward is plentiful, and so too is peace from heaven for those who do so kindly and graciously. Your eyes shall see wise and intelligent children and grandchildren like olive shoots around your table. Your homes will be full of all that is good. Neither wealth nor honor will cease from your descendants until the fulfillment of they will see the glory of Hashem and the majesty of our God. And that is the guarantee of the Zerah Shimshon for those that learn his Torah. That's just a part of his introduction. So he brings in the Ma'amar. The, the Gemara says, Sota Perek Kama, Sota first Perek, page Yud Amud Bet. It says, in the Gemara, in Sota, it discusses the episode between Yehuda and Tamar. Everybody knows the famous episode between Yehuda and Tamar. Tamar was Yehuda's daughter-in-law. Yehuda being one of the main Shevatim. And um, we're not going to go so, in so much great detail about the story of Tamar and Yehuda, but Tamar, in, in a way... Um, I don't want to use the word tricked because she, this was not about trickery. Tamar was a big tzaddiket, a very big tzaddiket. Um, but she made it so that Yehuda um, li- uh, what? Noticed. Yehuda noticed her, lay with her, and she became pregnant from Yehuda. None of this was, there's no, nothing wrong with it halachically. It's a discussion in front of the time. But yet, she, he still did not know that it was Tamar. Um, three months pass, and they come to Yehuda and they say, listen, Tamar Zanta, Tamar has become a zona. She's, she's, been, she's pregnant. She must have been with somebody. She wasn't allowed to be with anybody else. So um, he says, okay, burn her. If she's chayav mita, if she's if she is to be killed, then kill her. That's the law of the land. This is a law of the land that Yehuda himself had placed in place, put in place. To which, when they bring her, when they tell her that she's going to be burnt, she says, "Hakerna." For those, meaning he had. Um, she had, uh, she had certain items that belonged to Yehuda that she had gotten from him at the first meeting as collateral. It was his ring, his staff, and his shawl. So she says to the people, whoever these things belong to, that's the father of the baby. So they go to Yehuda. She said, whoever these things belong to is the father of the baby. Yehuda says, Ay. you know, it's himself. So he had a, Yehuda had a choice to make over here. A very difficult choice. Does he say, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, what is it? It's a staff. I don't care. Whatever. Just burn her. And the story would have been done. No embarrassment for you at all. Or 
he could come clean. What did Yehuda choose to do? Not only did he come clean, he pretty much came clean publicly. It was known to his friends, family, whoever was there. And he said the, the, the famous words that he spoke, Tzadkami meni. She is right. She basically, she's got me. You know? That's what the Gemara in Sota discusses. The, in Gemara it says, Vayaker Yehuda, Yehuda recognized, Vayomer Tzadkami meni. And he said that she is right. It is from me. Hainu dama Rav Hanan bar bizna. This is what Rav Hanan bar bizna says. Yosef shekidesh shem shamayim baseter. Yosef atzadik, who sanctified God's name in private. Zacha vehosifu lo ot mishemo shel akadosh baruchu. He had the zechut. He merited to have a letter of God's name added to his name. How so? As it says, dichtiv edut bi bi Yosef. Samo, as it says in Parashat Zota Beracha, he made a testimony for Yosef. Be Yosef. Instead of Be Yosef, it says Be Yosef. When Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, speaking to Bnei Israel before he passes on, and he names each Shevet, and he says a pasuk about each Shevet, this is what he says about Yosef at Tzadik. Be Yosef Lamo. Uh, Be Yosef Samo. I do it Be Yosef Samo. He made a testimony for Yosef on this day. So now, Yosef Atzadi got a hey added to his name. Why? Because he sanctified God's name in private. When did Yosef Atzadi sanctify God's name in private? Right. When Potiphar's wife was suggesting and trying to seduce him over and over and over. And it says over there, the Pasuk says in the Torah, in that parasha, there was nobody there. Everyone had gone to some kind of party. There was no one there to see. No one, no one would have found out. No one would have seen. Yet Yosef Atzadik, imagine, a young boy. Can you shut that off, please? A young boy, um, as far as he knows, abandoned by his entire family. Not wanted by anybody. No one searching for him. He is a slave in the most rotten place in the world, in Egypt. He's as good as dead. Yet he does not succumb to his physical needs. Where the Gemara says, quite clearly, the Gemara says that Potiphar's wife was extremely beautiful. Extremely beautiful. He was, he, he, but he still did not give in. He would not. But it was in private. So it says, when Yosef Tzadik did not succumb to the suggestion of Potiphar's wife to lay with her, and he was not seduced by this seductress, Ehe got added to his name in that zechut. Then it says, Yehuda shekidesh shem shamayim befarhesya. However, when Yehuda sanctified God's name in public, it wasn't in private. He merited that his entire name is named after Hashem. Yehuda has the entire of, entirety of Hashem's name, Yud K Vav K, is inside the name Yehuda. Because he publicized the sanctification of God's name, his entire name is named after Hashem. Has Hashem's entire name in it. Where Yosef at Sadiq, when he did it in private, he only got a hey. What do we say about questions? Hold, hold your questions. Hold your questions. I'm just going to... second. Okay. So now... Kashe, he says there's a difficulty here. Zash Mishon says it's dif there's something of a difficulty here. Devish Lama said Yosef HaShayach no Marzacha because by Yosef HaTzadik you could say that he merited a hey in his name. He merited a part of Hashem's name in his name. Shachar Shasa Ma'asatov, because after he did this good act, this righteous act, and he did not, he resisted the advances of Potiphar's wife. Nitan lo Secharo, he was rewarded with the extra letter in his name. Aval Yehuda 
Karuoto ken be'et leda. But Yehuda was not the same. His name was given to him at birth. I can't believe no one thought of that, by the way. This is a very simple question. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, you guys are hilarious. Yehuda was born and he was named Yehuda at birth. So how could the Gemara say, because Yehuda sanctified God's name in public, he was Zocheh, he merited having God's name in his name. What do you mean? He was named that when he was born. Before any decision-making powers. Before he made any decisions to whether to come clean or not. Yosef, on the other hand, Yosef at Sadiq, no. That you could say he merited it because what? He sanctified God's name. Whether public or not, he sanctified God's name. That's how he got a he added to his name later. So the at the end of the Torah, right? So in the end of the Torah, in Parshat Zotah Baracha, he's referred to as Bi Yosef, Yehosef. When Moshe refers to him, like, yes. When Moshe Rabbeinu refers to him, yes. We refer to all the tzaddikim, patriarchs and matriarchs, by their titles, Moshe Rabbeinu. Which is a question in itself, I feel like, because like we never refer to Yosef as Bi Yosef, nor do we talk about how he got a He added to his name. Right, so it's kind of going to be addressed. It's going to be addressed here. <laughs> so he continues. Ve'od. I don't know if we're going to get to the second question, but he says, and furthermore, Ma'u hayunu the Amar Rav Nachman. It said because the Gemara says, when the Gemara brings this, um, like, answer as to uh, why Yehuda got his name and how y- Yosef got the uh, letter it says Hayinu da'amar Rav Nachman Barbizna this is what Rav Nachman Bar- Bar- Hanan, uh, Rav Hanan Barbizna meant Hayinu da'amar this is what he was referring to so he's saying why does the Gemara stated like that this is what he was referring to just say this is what Rav Hanan Barbizna said you know this is what he was referring to when he said just say this is what Rav, Rav Hanan Barbiza said. That's it. But yes, Lomar. She says, we can explain as follows. This is a very interesting concept. It says, even though Yehuda's name was given to him at birth, even though he already had the name Yehuda, and we're still saying, oh, he was Zoha to the name Yehuda. Why? Because he came clean publicly. He sanctified God's name. Even though, I mean, that hadn't even happened. He was, he was born, he was given that name by his mama. By his mother. Even though his name was called Yehuda at birth, we can still call it being meriting. It's still referred to as meriting the name of God. Why? He says he's brought this down in Megillat Esther that when it says over there that on Zayn Adar, seventh of Adar, Moshe Rabbeinu passed away and he was also born on the seventh of Adar. It says, which we wrote over there in the name of Sefer Hasidim, which he says uh, that over there he proves that the actions that a person chooses to make during their lifetime actually re- affect the circumstances of their birth, surrounding their birth. Meaning, The decisions that a, make, a person makes during their lifetime, believe it or not, retroactively are connected to the name that he was given at birth or she was given at birth. So that the, so that the reason... So basically what he's saying, that the future actions in a way, the future actions, good deeds of a person's are, of a person are, so to speak, predestined at birth. That doesn't mean you are destined to do certain things. It means that at birth, you are destined to have certain kohot to do certain things. You have it within you to do them. It's still going to be your choice, your option to do those things or not. But when you do them, it counts as a zechut. And retroactively, it says, ah, and that's why his name was called... So and so, even though he was called that already. Sharekativ, because it says, Uvterem tetsem mirechem ichdashticha. 
It says, before you left the womb, I sanctified you. That was in Yirmiyah. It says, before you even came out of your mother's womb, I had already sanctified you. That's what Hashem says. And it says, and it's also brought down, Asher Kiddush Yedid Mi Beten. We say, usually we say that at Brit Milah, we say this Pasuk, Asher Kiddush Yedid Mi Beten, or Mi Beten, that who has sanctified uh, uh, um, the beloved from the womb. Meaning, the sanctification is done before the birth even. That a child was already having those kohot of Kedusha within them. So this was, in a way, a prophecy that Yehuda's name should be called Yehuda with Hashem's name in it. Is there any doubt that our matriarchs had prophecy? No. He was called Yehuda by Le'aimenu, and Le'aimenu through prophecy prophesied that his name has to be Yehuda, right? So his name was Yehuda, and the prophecy within that was, someday Yehuda's going to have a choice to make. And when he makes that right choice of making a Kiddush Shamaim, a, 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 a Kiddush Hashem, then he's going to be zochet to the name that he was given at birth. He's going to finally merit the name that he was given. And what if he made the wrong decision? Then not. Then not. That's a good question. So why would he have that name if he didn't make the question, make, make the decision? But. In a sense, I think we see that, in a way, I don't want to get into the whole questions of destiny and stuff like that. You know, predestined things and stuff. I don't want to get into that. Okay. What? I said I would love that. Ah, yes, you would. Yeah, you had a question. Complicate the whole like destiny, free will thing. But the bottom line is, I feel like we will always have free will, but things will always be predestined. Like it's as if like so many of the things happen in the Torah are meant for us to learn from them. Like I feel like I feel like this was pre like predestined that Yehuda would do that. It was still his choice. He could have not made that choice. But in a sense, of course, God always knew that he would have. And then it's meant for, like, I feel like the Jewish people to be able to look back and realize that we all have choices to make in our lives and they can lead to greatness. Thank you. That was your answer. Not really. Not really. Bechol ha'imahot and all the major... Huh? How no. come she gets to answer the question? Bechol ha'imahot hayu and all the matriarchs were nevi'im. All the matriarchs that we had were prophetesses. As it says in Midrash Rabbah, the end of Parashat Toledot, It actually says in a Midrash Rabbah, at the end of Parashat Toledot, they called him Yehuda because he was going to later on in the future make a big Kiddush Hashem. It says it smack in the Midrash Rabbah already. In Parashat Toledot, that he was called Yehuda. Why? Because he was going to make a Kiddush Hashem later on. And that was going to be a befitting name for him to have Hashem's name in it. In his name. Of Yosef lo hayu yecholim la'asot ken. However, with Yosef, we couldn't. So you have to ask yourself. We ask. You have to ask. Why was it that Yosef's name at birth wasn't Yehosef? So if Yehuda had his name at birth, with Hashem's name in it, have Yosef's name also at birth, Yehosef. The extra letter should already be in there. Why wouldn't Yosef deserve the same thing? He says, but Yosef, you couldn't do that. Wow, this is beautiful. So beautiful. Because he made a Kiddush Hashem in private. So, and we didn't know or no one would have known that he's going to be Mekadesh Shamaim or he's going to be Mekadesh Shamaim. Because if something's happening privately, no one's going to know about it. Right? Therefore, if the letter He would not be added to his name later on, no one would ever ask, why was a He added to Yosef's name? 
for us to research the answer and go, oh, because he made a Kiddushem Shamaim, because he made a Kiddushem Shamaim in private, he got added to his name. If he was always Yehosef, we would have never known that he's done something extra and he received something extra because of it. Because it wasn't publicized, it wasn't something public. It was totally in private. Therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made it so that an extra hay is getting added later on in the Torah to Yosef's name for us to say, ah, you know why this hay got added? Because of the Kiddush Shem Shamayim that Yosef HaTzadik made in Potiphar's home. Do you understand? Yehuda's name was Yehuda because it was a public thing. It's straight in the Torah. It says, you know, it was public and everybody knew about it. So, okay, he's Yehuda. You know why he's Yehuda? Because he stands for truth and he was Mekadosh Shem Shamayim in public. Yosef HaTzadik, it wasn't a private thing. No one else knew about it except Yosef. Or at least he thought. This is what we're going to talk about today. Kemosha Katava Ayun Yaakov, he says, the Ayun Yaakov says, Sha'al yede shinui shemo yish'alu ha'olam ata'am shel shinui zeh. Because of the change of Yosef HaTzadik's name, the world is going to ask, why was there a change in Yosef's name? Why is Moshe Rabbeinu calling Yosef Yehosef all of a sudden? Why did he deserve this hay? What was the zechut for him to receive this hay? Vayavohu ladat shedirei shem shamayim. And then they will come to the conclusion that, ah, it's because he was mekadesh shem shamayim. Ve'im haya nigrakach be'et ledato, but if he was called Yehosef at birth, lo hayu margishim klal. They wouldn't really, no one would really realize his name had any significance to the sanctity of Hashem's name. Because that episode with Potiphar's wife was completely hidden and it was in private, in seclusion. Just like the Sota. The story, this story was brought down in the Gemara Sota, in a tractate Sota in Talmud. What does the tractate Sota talk about? A woman that is called a Sota. What was a sota? A sota was a woman that was found in seclusion with another man. Married man, married woman, sorry, a married woman that was found in seclusion with another man after being warned by her husband not to be found with this man in seclusion. Never be in private with this man. Now, has she done anything with this man? We don't know. That's why she's called a sota. You do not know if anything went on between her and this other man. There's a question here. Dikhtiv ba, the pasuk says with, about the sota, says, Venistera vehi nitma. She became secluded and might have become defiled. We don't know. She was secluded with this person, that we know. Did she really do anything, Asur? We don't know. Therefore, they would bring her to the Beit HaMikdash. They would interview her. And then publicly, she would have to drink the May Sota, the waters of the Sota from the Beit HaMikdash. And if she actually had acted unfaithfully towards her husband, huh? Right, she, <laughs> you're quick to say that. Yeah, she, <laughs> she, she, would, she would die in the most, like, excruciating way, she would literally blow up from the inside, blow from within, and if she had not actually done anything wrong, she would actually be blessed. If she was not pretty, she would become pretty. If she, wa she, had, if she was sick, she would become healthy. If she had, didn't have children, she was not able to conceive, she would start b being able to conceive. She would receive all the blessings. Right? This is what uh, Chana and Avia, this is what Chana kind of th quote unquote threatened God with. When she wanted to have a child and she couldn't conceive, she kind of, she, in her words, she threatens Hashem. She says, if she's not blessed, she's just gonna have to try to make her husband think that she's cheating on him so that she'll have to become a sota, she'll go drink the water, and then God has to give her children. That's what she says in her tefillah. That's how badly she wanted to have children, right? And then she became the mother of Shmuel Anavi, one of the greatest prophets 
ever lived, right? So that is the, 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 the basically the gist of the story of the Sota woman. <clears throat> so over there it says also, Venistera, she was hidden, so to speak. She was secluded and she might have become Tameh. So just as the Torah has this protocol to reveal what really happened with the Sota that was in seclusion, a letter was also added to Yosef's name to reveal what really happened with Potiphar's wife. So the Sota, how do you figure out what happened with the Sota? Whether she really was defiled or not? She has to come and drink the water, da 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 so that people will know really what went on. So that the, if she's innocent, her husband will know she's innocent. She'll be loved by her husband again. She'll be loved by the community again. No one's going to be like, oh, it's her. She was a... No, it's going to come clear. Everyone's going to know exactly what happened. So that she's innocent, everyone's going to know she's innocent. And she's going to be blessed for all the embarrassment she went through. Right? So Yosef at Sadiq was also kind of like a sota. He was in seclusion with this woman. Everyone's going to be wondering what happened. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu added a hey. No one's going to ask any questions. Hashem added his name to Yosef HaTzadik. Just like Hashem adds, so to speak, his name to that woman that was a sota. If she was innocent, she becomes beautiful, she becomes pregnant, she needs children, she becomes blessed. What is that? That's literally Hashem. It's a blessing of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So Hashem said, Yosef HaTzadik also gets my blessing through my letter, hey. In his name. So that everybody, just like when the Sota is innocent, everyone will know she's innocent. So too, Yosef Tzadik, everyone, all of history will know that Yosef is a true Tzadik. He was truly Tzadik when he didn't have to be. At least what anyone else would think. You know, seclusion, no one's going to see it. Umikol sheken. eshet potifar macheshet. Especially with Potiphar's wife in this incident, uh, Potiphar's wife was completely going against uh, Yosef Atzadik's words. Imagine, you're a slave. It's a slave's word against a, a noble woman of the highest caliber in Mitzrayim. You know? Imagine her coming and saying, It's my word against yours. You think I'm going to believe that you, I was trying to seduce you? You're crazy. Imagine that. She was threatening him. And she was right. She actually went through with it. She told everyone that he was trying to take advantage of her. Right? That, that happens, unfortunately, when the woman's not noble blood. And you know what I mean? How much more so when, when Yosef was, was a, a slave over there. Imagine the thoughts that were going through his head. Safety. He was going to get killed. Right? He was thinking like, if he doesn't go through with it, she's going to blame him, and he's going to get killed. Off with his head. No one's going to believe him. No one's going to believe that he's clean. Yet he didn't do it. Yet he didn't do it. And as far as he was concerned, no one's ever going to know. He was thrown in jail for 10 years. No one would ever, as far as he was concerned, no one would ever find out about his innocence. Imagine the Yosef at Sadiq's honor in Shamayim. Every time we repeat, we repeat those words, right? Be Yosef Samo. In the parsha, when Yosef HaTzadik has a hey added to his name, the elevation Yosef HaTzadik's neshama gets each time when he says, yes, I was totally innocent, no one believed me. I was totally innocent, no one believed me. No one was there to watch, no one knew about it, no one saw, but I didn't do anything wrong. But no one would believe me. But there was someone watching. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is always watching. You know, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Victor Miller, Zechat Tzadik V'Hakadosh Libracha, said something very beautiful. He said that he came, he came from Slabotka, old Europe. You know what I mean? So he was saying that in his experience, he's like, I come from a place where the Tzadikim of that generation the rabbis of that generation, the chachamim of that generation, said, you would never even see them yawn. You wouldn't see one rabbi ever play with their beard or scratch their head. They were so perfectly put together. You would never catch a rav yawning even. They wouldn't bring themselves to such thing. Because that's such kavod. That's such class. Because they felt 
I'm a representation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. If I represent the Kedusha, if I represent Hashem, how could I just open my mouth in public? I know to us it's a very distant idea. Like we're thinking like, okay, you're yawning again. People pick their nose all the time. You know? <laughs> it's like yawning. But to them it was a huge deal. And, uh, and Rav Miller was saying, it was because they constantly felt HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence in every moment of their life. You are being recorded every second. Hashem is watching every move. If Hashem was standing right before you and you're having a conversation right now, okay? Imagine. Imagine. Hashem, imagine he had a body for a second. Kav Yachol, Has Shalom. Right? And he came down and he's like, hey, you know... Gabby, I want to speak to you for a second. Would you even sneeze? I don't care how many feathers go up your nose. You'd be like, mm. you will hold it. You will hold it. Veins will internally start like, you will not sneeze. Because it's God. You're standing in front of a Kadosh Baruch Hu. How could you sneeze? How could you yawn? How could you raise your hand to scratch your head? Like you'd, you'd be shivering. That's how Chachamim felt at every moment of their lives. That's how Yosef HaTzadik felt. Those moments he felt, no one else is watching, but Kadosh Baruch is always watching. He knows. Imagine going to jail afterwards and thinking to yourself, maybe he didn't know. I don't know. Does he know that I'm innocent? I don't know. You know, anyone else would think that. Did Yosef HaTzadik think that? No. He went through all of it. Proved everyone wrong. And he got the hay in his name at the end to prove it. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave this as a gift for the world to know what Yosef HaTzadik really did in private. Be Yosef Samo. Yosef HaTzadik's name changes to Yosef with the extra hay. Hashem giving him a gift of Kiddush Hashem in public. The fact that he did it in private, Hashem made it public. Aval Yehuda. But Yehuda, Shekidesh Shem Shamayim Ba'faresia, Yehuda who made a Kiddush Shem Shamayim publicly, Hakol Yod Imbo, everybody knew about it. Everyone found out about it. Bahayu Yecholim Likroto Kach Meledato. Therefore, from the beginning at birth, they could call him that. Because everyone would just refer back and go, you know why he's called Yehuda? His name matches him because of what he did. Did you see what he did with Tamar? Did you see how he came out and clear? And, you know? So he deserves that name. He was given that name. It was rightfully his. Hashem's name is in his name because he has this kind of character. He's so truthful. And he came and made a Kiddush Shem Shamayim in public. He didn't shy away. But with Yosef, at that time, nobody knew. You think anybody in Egypt, anybody else in his family knew what Yosef at Sadiq went through? When he was in Potiphar's home, nobody knew about it. Therefore, it had to come afterwards so people could ask, why did Yosef have a hay added to his name? Ah, because he was Mekadeh Shem Shamayim. But it was private. So Hashem wanted everyone to know what happened in private with Yosef at Sadiq. Talking about um, making a Kiddush Hashem and talking about how Hashem watches everything. You know, we, we've, talking, we've, we've spoken about this multiple times about how the choices that we make are recorded. Literally recorded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Nothing is forgotten. Nothing is for naught. Everything makes a difference. And everything has repercussions for all of history. Imagine, for instance, Yosef Atzadi, if he would not have made that decision to say no to Potiphar's wife multiple times. She didn't just go for it one time. Multiple times. Imagine if Yosef Atzadik had caved. What would be the history of Yosef Atzadik? What would be his lineage? What would, what would be of him? You know, you think when Yosef Atzadik was making that decision, he was thinking, what's going to be written in the Torah about me later? You think he knew he's going to be written in, you know what I mean? Like, he's not thinking like that. He was just a kid trying to survive, literally. And we're all in life the same way. We're just trying to get by. We're not really thinking, ah, does it really make a difference what I eat right now? 
Does it really make a difference if I make the choice of kosher whether versus non-kosher? Does it really make a difference if I make the choice right now whether if this kashrut is really trustable, it's not really trustable? Is it really trustworthy? Is it, is it really? Like, what difference do I make? I'm a speck of nothing in all this huge, vast universe. But we're not. What makes you feel, what makes you think that you're any less than Yosef Tzadik? What makes you think that you're any less than Yehuda? You think Yehuda at that time when he made that declaration in front of everyone publicly, coming clean, you think he was thinking, ah, I'm going to go down in the books for what I just did right now. I doubt that that's what he was thinking. He was thinking, ah, oh, this is embarrassing, but I'm not going to shy away from it. Let it be known. I'm a man of emet, I'm a man of truth, and I'm going to come forward with it. Whatever it may take. You know what it, what it, what it, what it got him? You know who came from that birth? Tamar. 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 From one of the children comes the, the Davidic dynasty, King David and Moshiach. And from the other child comes Nevi'im, prophets. Do you understand? Do you understand? It's incredible. Decisions we make have repercussions for all of eternity. Every single one of us. No one, no one is insignificant. No one. I was listening to a, uh, a um, you know, you guys know Rabbi Gold, Yol Gold sends videos, very beautiful videos of interviews he does with different people, stories of life stories. I, I, I was listening to a very fascinating one about a Mr. Aaron... Um, Fierstein that in the 90s 1995 there was a huge uh, fire in a, a huge factory in Massachusetts uh, it was a factory of fabric fabrics and stuff like that owned by Mr. Fierstein um, he was 70 years old at the time he was having his birthday and during his birthday party, one of his men comes to him and he says, Mr. Feuerstein, your factory is on fire. There's a fire. By the time he gets there, most of the factory is gone. This was the biggest factory in the United States at the time. Just imagine what this was. All gone. Uh, 3,000 workers. He had 3,000 employees in this factory. Um, right after the fire, um, he received notice that his payoff from insurance company is about half a billion dollars. Just imagine how big this company was. $300 million was his insurance. That's how much money he received. Now, people, this is 1995. You know what $300 million was in 1995? A lot. So, what can he do? 70 years old, what would any businessman at 70 years old do with, three, with $300 million? Take the money, retire, have a great life. Or, he could take the money, reinvest in another factory, somewhere else, cheaper labor, and make triple, double, triple amount of the money. You guys should watch the interviews you guys should really search this online. I did. He made a public statement on, on the news. I think it was the next day. This is the statement he made. He's going to rebuild the factory nowhere else, right where it was before. Until the factory is rebuilt, all 3,000 employees will be receiving their monthly checks every single month, including bonuses. He paid every single employee all those months, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, supported all of them, factory was rebuilt, and they were all rehired to work in the same factory. In an interview, a news reporter asked him, what made you do this? 
basically what they're asking, if I may, if I may say so, what man in the right mind does what you just did? 70 years old, just, okay, it's over, you had a good run. Your factory's burnt down. It was in his family for three generations. His grandfather had built it. He was the third generation. Okay, you didn't do anything wrong. Take the money, maybe send one bonus to the workers. Thank you for working so hard, and that's it. So they asked him, what made you do this? And he said that his father used to always tell him, in a place when there's no man, in this pasuk, when it means when there's no man, it means when there's no morality. Man is referred to as someone that stands up for what's right in this sense. When a, there's a, if you're in a place that there is no man, try to be that man. That is what he said to news reporters. His father told him, rang in his ear. Just because other people do whatever, doesn't mean you should. You be the better man. You be the better person. You be that light in the darkness. And I was just thinking about this passage. You could possibly define it a different way as well. That goes so well with Yosef HaTzadik. In a place when there is no one around. No one's there to see you. No one's there to see what decision you're about to make. No one's going to know what went down. Be a man. Be moral. Be good. Even though there's no one around to see. Because if there is an ish, if there is no man, there's still a Kadosh Baruch Hu. He's always watching. You know what a huge Kiddush Hashem he made? The incredible, he was in a, in a different interview, he was saying, and the guy asked him, he said, you could have just, you know, taken the money and just gone. And, he's, and he very surprisingly, he said, and do what? Eat more? Buy another suit? So that what? What a Kiddush Hashem. That's how you sanctify Kadosh Baruch Hu's name in, 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 in public. But I think it goes very well with Yosef HaTzadik also. This pasuk, b'makom she'en ish. Just remember, I, I really like the sound of when, when you, there's no one around, even when you don't see anyone around, still, lehiot ish, to still be that same straightforward person even though you don't know if anyone's watching. We have the famous story of Reuven with Yosef HaTzadik. Right? They threw Yosef HaTzadik in a well. Reuven suggested it. He said, don't kill him, throw him in a well. So, threw him in a pit. And a Torah over there says, it was a ruse, it was a trick. Reuven was trying to tell them, to, to make them put him in a pit so that later he can come and grab him and take him back home. Right? The Torah attests to it. And it says, imagine if Reuven knew what the Torah is going to say about him. If he only knew that the Torah is going to attest to the fact of how kind-hearted he was being. He was trying to save Yosef HaTzadik's life. If he had known that such a thing would be written about him centuries later, Thousands of years, it's going to be read. Every single day, every Shabbat, it's going to be read. You know what he would have done? He would have taken Yosef, put him on his shoulders and ran home. Forget about putting him in a pit. If only we knew how much every act that we do, how much it has an effect, it would change our decision making so much. We would make such different decisions in our lives. If at every moment we would think, I am being watched. And Hashem is with me every step of the way. Even if it's going to seem very difficult. Even if, if, if it seems very bleak. Doesn't matter. The right decision needs to be made and I'm going to make it and Hashem is going to be with me. You never know. 
Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu records everything in Tzfarim. Everything is recorded. You never know. We're all going to be in that huge Torah scroll when Moshiach comes. We're all going to be in that book of history. We're all a part of that history. No one's insignificant. I think that's the strongest message. One of the strongest messages we can take home from this parasha. Mamash. One of the strongest messages we can take. I, 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 it kind of gives me shivers in my body. It really does. I was discussing it with my wife the other night as well. Just, you know, to imagine that you're constantly in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what a Jew has to feel. We are constantly in front of Hashem. How would you act? How would you carry yourself? Maybe there are things we could learn from the Chachamim of Slabotka. You know, how they held themselves, how they carried themselves. That's what a Jew needs to be. I am always a prince. I am always before the king of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I represent the king of the universe. People look at me and they say, that's a representation of God's glory. So it's not about dress codes. It's not about, ah, oh, how far is it called tzniut? If it's up to here, is it tzniut? If it's up to here, is it... How many inches does it have to be below the knee for it to be called tzanua? How much of your hair has to be covered? What kind of shaitel should a person wear? All these questions so many people have would not be a question. It would just, if you would just take a moment and think... How does it look in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? How do I look in front of the Shekhinah? Every single one of us, man and a woman, is before the Shekhinah. How do you want to look in front of the Shekhinah? How do you want to represent yourself in front of Hashem's glory? I don't think it goes by measurements. I don't think that's how it works. I come from a world... You know, my grandparents, great-grandparents, I doubt that they dealt with measurements. How, how, how far does your skirt gonna come down? How, how far, where, where is your neckline? They didn't deal with that. It was built in. This is what it means to be a woman. This is what it means to be a Yiddish, a, a Jewish wife. A Jewish woman to represent Hakadosh Baruch Hu. This is what it means to be a Jewish man. You know, sometimes people ask me, uh, uh, you know, about these, uh, you know, rabbinic hats. Sfardim wear them. Do Sfardim not wear them? We're not even going to get into that. But my grandfather, Alaba Shalom, who was born in Iran, wore a hat all the time. He wouldn't go out without his hat. It was disrespectful if he would step out of the house without a hat. He always had a pressed vest, pressed jacket, suit. That's how he went out. Clean. That's how a Jew represents HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Why do you wear a hat? Because that's what a mensch does. At least those days, that was the dress code. And you have to have... You need to have the dress code as a mensch. You present HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Doesn't matter you're a rabbi, you're not a rabbi, you're a rabbitzin, you're not a rabbitzin. Don't think in those terms. These are new terms. What really matters is, how do you want to represent HaKadosh Baruch Hu? That's what we have to think on a daily basis. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.